Next talk up, uh, intro to graffiti, virtual graffiti, and this is Tony Koff. Let's give her a big hand. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Like he said, I'm Totenkopf of the Neuronumerous Group, um, and today I will be talking to you about virtual graffiti. I originally wasn't going to submit this year or present a speech, but um, then Neon Rain and I got into a discussion about the growth of hacking electronic construction road signs, and then we uh, started talking about virtual graffiti in general and how outside of the graffiti research lab, there's really not a lot going on or a lot of information about it. Next thing I knew, I was cursing her name and submitting my CFP. So before I get into all of the nitty gritty details about virtual graffiti, we're gonna discuss what it is. All right. The most commonly used definition for virtual graffiti is that it involves the use of virtual objects and or digital messages, images, animations, etc., that are applied to or viewable from public locations. They can be viewable through electronic devices such as computers or mobile devices, <clears throat> but are quickly expanding beyond that and can be seen on digital billboards, road signs, and the side of buildings. I know that this sounds like a very large subject, and it is, so, uh, so much so that I have decided to break the speech up into four different parts. Uh, first, we'll cover the history of graffiti, uh, where we're gonna discuss where it originated and how it got to the point where it is today. After that, we'll go over some examples where I'll be covering things that have been done for a little while and as well as some things that are shiny and new. And once I planted evil little ideas into your mind, <laughs> we're going to move on to legal concerns and government responses to graffiti. And finally, uh, who would be interested in this and why they should be interested in this. So now that we all know what virtual graffiti is, we have to recognize the fact that we wouldn't be able to do virtual graffiti if we didn't have regular graffiti first. <clears throat> um, but does anyone have a guess as to how long graffiti has been around? Come on. Oh, does it? <laughs> So this just gave up the fact that I didn't do my slides. <laughs> um, <laughs> unfortunately, Toten Dad is the one who does all my slides, and Nikita yells at me every year to do my own damn slides, and this is why. Um, so yeah, 30,000 years ago, and started with cave paintings and pictographs that were uh, made out of animal bones and uh, pigments. The reason that I say arguably is because there's some debate as to whether or not uh, the cave drawings were really graffiti. Um, prehistoric graffiti was occasionally used in religious celebrations and in those instances were endorsed by society, which is contradictive uh, to the current day definition of graffiti. Although it's debatable whether the cave drawings are examples of early graffiti, we can definitely say that it was popular in ancient Greece. <laughs> um, in fact, the first known example of Grecian graffiti is viewable in the ancient city of Ephesus, which is in uh, present-day Turkey. Uh, the first graffiti drawing was evidently an advertisement for prostitution and was etched into stone near mosaics and walkways. The image itself was of a heart-shaped handprint, kind of like that, a footprint, and a number. The heart-shaped handprint was meant to represent uh, love in exchange for money, and the footprint and number are believed to represent how far one would have to walk in order to receive these services. Similarly, the ancient Romans are known for carving graffiti on walls and monuments. Some examples include curses, magic spells, political slogans, declarations of love, alphabets, and literary quotes all of which were preserved in Pompeii after the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. There was also ancient Roman carvings that were made by young men to make themselves feel big, most of which can be found around at uh, gladiatorial academies, including one by Salatus, which states, uh, Suspirium Polarum Salatus Thrakes, or Salatus the Thracian makes the girls sigh. <laughs> Not to be outclassed by the Greeks, though. Um, the Romans were also known for using graffiti to advertise prostitution. In one area, you can find an address for a well-known prostitute named uh, Novelia Primigena of Nuceria. And uh, in another, you can find etchings of phalluses with mansueta tene, or in English, handle with care, scrawled next to it.
There are other many uh, lesser known instances of pre-modern graffiti, uh, including but not limited to carvings on the walls of uh, royal and or wealthy homes in the Ma of Mayans in the site of Tikal in Guatemala. The Vikings left markings and etched their names into ruins in Rome, New Grange, Mound in uh, Ireland. And one Viking, Halvdan, put his names on runes on a banister in um, Constantinople. Constantinople. I can't pronounce it. I'm from America. We don't care about anything outside of America, really. Um, various Renaissance artists would travel to um, the... No. No. Yeah. Various Renaissance artists would travel to the ruins of Nero's Domus Aurora in order to carve or paint their names. French soldiers would carve their names on monuments during uh, the Napoleonic campaigns uh, in, um, in Egypt. And travelers along the Oregon Trail left their names at Signature Rock. Now, that is all of the pre-modern stuff. None of the techniques that were used back then to make the drawings and or carvings are used in modern day graffiti even though the messages and the thoughts and feelings behind them are the same as what's seen today. Uh, with that said, we are now moving on to history of modern day graffiti. Okay. <clears throat> In the 60s and 70s, graffiti started to gain popularity with political activists and gangs wanting to mark their territory and make themselves heard. Once it started to become more popular in places like New York City, Graffiti started to migrate from being out on the streets to the subway system. The main goal at that time was relatively simple, or simple. Out tag and out bomb the other graffiti artists in the area. For those of you who don't know, bombing is used to refer to creating large, more elaborate pieces of graffiti art, usually done by uh, breaking into closed off areas like subway depots after work hours so that there is a lower chance of getting caught while you're drawing. <clears throat> also during this time, the use of designs such as polka dots, cross hatches, and checkers were becoming more popular. The use of spray paint increased um, in order to expand what the graffiti artists could do and how fast. And the appearance of top to bottoms, or works which span the entire height of a subway train, became more popular. The combination of all these innovations in graffiti has led to this period of time being referred to as the Golden Age. Unfortunately, the 80s became a time when it was increasingly harder to tag or bomb, especially in New York City, which was and still is considered to be the epicenter of the graffiti movement in the US. Um, <clears throat> some of the reasons why new pieces were getting rarer include the fact that the burgeoning drug, drug trade increased the amount of firearms out on the streets, making tooling around at night more difficult and dangerous. The police were able to dole out regular and more severe punishments to graffiti artists that they caught and store owners were forced to restrict their sales of spray paint. They weren't allowed to sell to people under 18, and they had to keep everything locked up in cages to uh, dissuade shoplifting. Um, and finally, the local transit authorities caused a lot of problems when they used the increase in their anti-graffiti budget to build new and better fences around train yards, hire more guards to patrol, and fund regular heavy buffing of train cars to keep them graffiti free. To the chagrin of uh, officials who thought that these measures would be enough to completely squash the movement, um, artists and, uh, and writers moved from underground trains back onto the streets as well as the top of buildings. <clears throat> After being relatively dormant in the 1990s, graffiti art has started to become active again in the past 10 years. Graffiti is being used by companies such as Sony and IBM as a way to break into guerrilla advertising, which is basically a buzzword for um, cheap and dirty ways to catch someone's eyes to buy your product or show interest in your company. Um, <clears throat> it is also becoming more popular in mainstream pop culture. It's showing up in video games like Jet Set Radio Future, Sony's Rakugaki Okaku series, Getting Up Contents Under Pressure, Super Mario Sunshine, Half-Life, and the Herbs, Sims, in the City. Even clothes designer Mark Echo uh, has publicly stated that graffiti art is without question the most powerful art movement in recent history and has been a driving inspiration throughout his career. <clears throat> 
Now that we've gone through all that, it's time for the part of the speech that most of you came here for, and that's the examples of virtual graffiti. We're going to start off with the tried and true stuff, all of which has been either pioneered or popularized by the Graffiti Research Lab. And as a side note, um, the examples that I'm going to show you appear all on their website with a list of materials as well as instructions. And in this section, I will be going in order of least to most difficult to do. The first examples we're going to cover are the most popular and most common of virtual graffiti, and that's the LED throwy and floaty. They are really cheap and easy to make, especially when ordered in bulk from sites from uh, Deal Extreme. Uh, for either floaties or throwies, you'll need LEDs and an assortment of colors and a uh, lithium battery and tape. If you're doing throwies, you'll need a magnet, obviously, because otherwise it won't stick to anything. You just look like a retard throwing LEDs. Or um, if you're doing floaties, you'll need balloons, otherwise they sink. Uh, next we have the electrograph. It can be as easy or as difficult as you want to make it. Likewise, it can either be as relatively inexpensive or um, expensive as you wish to make it. Um, the base materials are pretty simple. Conductive paint, magnetic paint, regular and or spray paints, stencils in case you're not comfortable freehanding, LEDs, and batteries. From there, you can add various different components like microprocessors photos, or uh, photoresistors so that the LEDs only come on during night or uh, even a proximity sensor so that it lights up or does something based on how close someone is to the art. <clears throat> the last example for the tried and true section is the Graffiti Research Lab's laser tag. The hardest part of this is acquiring the parts and setting it up at the site that you want to do this at. The materials that were listed on the GRL site for this project are a laptop, a 50,000 ANSI lumens uh, projector, a security astronomy camera with manual iris zoom lens, a magic arm with a super clamp, a PC TV USB capture card, and a 60 megawatt green laser. Uh, in some places that's illegal, by the way. And um, also don't shine it in animals or people's eyes because they'll go blind or really, really pissed off with you. Um, and you'll also need AAA batteries to power everything. Um, this setup can get pretty expensive, so it's worth looking around to pl at places like eBay, Craigslist, pawn shops, um, or if you have lots of money, you can give some to me and I can go buy it new from the store. Um, next we're going to do the shiny and new stuff in, on the virtual graffiti front. Although in the last section I was able to go in order from easiest to hardest, um, I'm going to be going from least to most obscure. Each of these three examples are relatively new, with the first two having been successfully and publicly attempted. Uh, we're going to start off with electronic roadside construction signs. <laughs> so toward the middle or end of, I think it was 2007, 2008, uh, people in the US started to see uh, more and more examples of people hacking into these roadside construction signs. Um, there are probably several different manufacturers, but most of them use the same one, which is, um, well, no, wait, I'm just going to say it, ADCO, A-D-D-C-O. Um, <clears throat> those are the ones that are most commonly hacked because they're the easiest in, to hack because they're the least secure. Um, <clears throat> and these are also the ones that are mostly used by Department of Transportation. Um, the first example, well, yeah, the first examples of hack signs were just like this one that warned drivers about zombies being ahead. Uh, since then, there have been many other instances of these signs being hacked, saying various things like Harvard sucks in Massachusetts, no Latinos, no tacos in Miami, and the ever clever this sign has been hacked. <clears throat> in January of 2009, iHacked featured a post that gave readers step-by-step -step instructions on how to hack into these signs and change the message to display whatever we want them to. I am both pleased and chagrined to say that they're still very accurate, as in around 5 o'clock before I hopped on the plane, I was able to go try it. I didn't change anything because um, I'm a wimp, but <laughs> I was able to get into the sign and, prove, and see that the uh, console was still in there. Um, not that I'm condoning 
breaking into roadside construction signs because I'm not. Do it. <laughs> um, the first item that I'm going to talk about isn't really a vulnerability. It's just a tip. These signs are really, 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 really easy to find. Uh, you don't have to drive around looking for them anymore. Um, your local Department of Transportation website has done that for you. Um, <clears throat> most of them are really helpful. You know, they want their drivers to know what's coming up. So they have a list of uh, ongoing and upcoming construction, or as well as uh, traffic jams, and they set up these signs there. So all you've got to do really is say go to nevadadot.com and um, <clears throat> go to their section called major products, studies, and uh, programs that give a list of places and dates, uh, make a list of them, drive out there, and um, <clears throat> where am I? Yeah, okay. And then a few days before construction starts, chances are that you'll see one of these signs erected. Um, and give you a time uh, and, and let you know when the construction is going to come up and how much time you have to plan for it and the hours that you have to avoid. <clears throat> Once you find an uh, electronic roadside construction sign, you want to have um, go to the access panel located at the back of the sign and you would expect to see it physically secured, right? Well, most time it's not. Most of the time, there's, it's left wide open. Well, not literally wide open, but there's no lock. If there is a lock, it's usually a master lock, which we all know is really secure and can't be picked or cut off. <laughs> um, <clears throat> once the back access panel is open, you'll find a nice little control, pan, a control pad with a full keyboard and a mostly easy to navigate menu. The control pad isn't usually password protected, but if it is, um, it's usually left at the default password. But if you found that one of the DOT workers were um, pretty clever and changed it, they've made it easy for you to reset the password. And uh, if you go to iHacked, it'll tell you what the default password is and how to reset the password. Like I said, my dad makes these slides for me, so yeah, don't be a dumbass. Um, all of, though most of this may make hacking one of these signs sound like a cakewalk, there are some things you need to be cautious and aware of. The roads that get these cautionary construction signs are usually high in traffic, so be careful not to plan to go out during rush hour, or um, also if the sign you want to hack warns of construction, avoid going an hour before or after the hours that are listed on the sign. Uh, that way you don't have a DOT worker coming up to you while you're trying to hack the sign, especially since most of these sites have police cars by them. Um, <clears throat> be wary of signs that are in commercial areas. Many stores, roads, and traffic lights are equipped with security cameras. And finally, use common sense. Wear gloves and be as inconspicuous as possible. If you're the only blue or purple hair person in your town, wear a fucking hat. <laughs> and uh, I shouldn't say this, or I shouldn't have to say this, but um, there's probably at least one of you that lacks common sense or a sense of self-preservation. Don't drive your car up to the sign and use the headlights for light. Plan ahead, get a flashlight or a headlamp and walk to the sign. Don't drive up to the sign. Um, next is something that at least a few of you know that I've been interested in for a few years now, and that's hacking um, the outdoor digital billboard network. Um, <clears throat> these signs are starting to become more and more popular. They're only made by, um, well, mostly one manufacturer, but they're owned by, you know, Clear Channel, and we love Clear Channel. Um, <clears throat> there are still only three types of digital billboards that are commonly used, and they are ones with Verizon Telephone, inter Verizon telephone Network Interface, which have uh, testing and wiring instructions on inside the panel, and they're easily uh, available and viewable by any passerby, and it suggests the presence of a basic go, no-go. Uh, billboards that work wirelessly and have a nondescript box at their base, um, like the one you see in the picture over there. Um, 
Uh, the existence of POTS combined with unencrypted wireless traffic poses security risks that have not been addressed by manufacturers. And finally, uh, billboards with an unlabeled box at its base secured by a master lock. These contain a control panel or a place to plug it in a, a laptop, um, make it easy for techs who go on site to work on the billboards. Um, so two years ago I presented, had a big presentation on just the outdoor digital billboard network. And um, each point I'm uh, about to discuss has been verified by CISOs and techs from various companies that are associated with the evil assholes who run the majority of these billboards as known security concerns that have been expressed before but have had nothing done about them. Um, maybe one of them has been addressed though I've been told but it's still an issue. Um, there are two types of vulnerabilities, network and physical. Uh, the network vulnerabilities include uh, packet sniffing, which is mostly applicable to the billboards with the wireless connectivity, uh, war dialing for the phone ones, <clears throat> and open ports. The physical vulnerabilities that can lead up to the hacking of these billboards are social engineering of marketing and technical staff. You can still use the tried and true, I'm a college student and I am doing a marketing research, or I'm an interested uh, consumer. Um, if that doesn't work, you can always find either a disgruntled employee or one of their techs who are really, really into their job and like talking about it. In that case, it's only going to cost you maybe a couple of beers. <clears throat> Poorly placed security cameras. Um, they currently have maybe one or two security cameras. One's posted straight at the sign to let them know if anything's going wrong with it. And um, another one pointed towards traffic. They don't have one towards the base to see if anybody's messing around. Um, and there's nothing separating you from the base of the billboard. There are no gates, barriers, or prickly plants to keep you from messing around down there. And of course, you know, there's the master lock, which can be picked or cut off. So now that we've covered that, there is an update on this, as well as some things that should be noted if you were going to try this. Uh, what I didn't know before and therefore couldn't present last time was that companies usually use digital signage software that is ran mostly on XP machines. The software company that distributes the software actively discourages the use of Apple and or Linux machines unless there's an XP virtual running on it because they think XP security issues are irrelevant. And that's a, actually a direct quote from their website. It's irrelevant. <laughs> um, as far as notes go, if you do do this, don't do it during peak hours or during the day. Be inconspicuous and uh, as always, mind the orange sticker. <clears throat> so the final example is something that I started to think about while I was flying down to Florida. Um, I had a layover in JFK and had time to walk around and get food. While I was waiting in the ridiculously long Dunkin' Donuts line, I got bored. I noticed that all of the restaurants there featured LCD screens with interactive menus. Now like most of you, when I get bored, my brain starts hatching um, evil ideas that usually get me into trouble. So that's when I realized, you know, these should be pretty easy to hack and display whatever I want to display on them. So without further ado, here's some information I got while researching these so you can take it and do with it as whatever you want. So um, first off, I want to note that uh, there are currently no known cases of these getting hacked. They're starting to grow in popularity though, um, only in places like airports, busier fast food restaurants, as well as in movie theaters. The software used to control and design these is the same that is used by the digital billboards. So they are only run on XP machines. Um, and they're locked in the manager's office. Um, these offices feature our best friend, an unsecured wireless network. Uh, field research has shown that if one were to sit either in the concession stand area with a half full Coke or near the bathroom with a bored look on your face, but with a netbook on you in both instances, one should be able not only to connect to the network, but view stuff that they probably hope you can't. Um, 
Now, since not all of us can be super hackers like Gregory Evans, I'm now going to cover government responses to graffiti as well as the inherent legal concerns associated with graffiti. All right, we're going to start off with uh, the United States. Um, there have been many pieces of graffiti-related re legislature passed. Many lawmakers view it as an, as an expensive form of vandalism requiring repair of vandalized property. The following laws are examples of such legislature that was passed in the past 25 years in response to the increase of graffiti art appearing on the streets. <clears throat> in 84, the Philadelphia Anti-Graffiti Network, or Pagan, was created to fight gang-related graffiti as well as commissioned murals from legitimate graffiti artists to be made at places that were common targets for gang-related graffiti. In 92, Chicago banned the sale and possession of spray paint as well as certain etching tools and markers. In 95, <clears throat> in 95 New York City officials created an anti-graffiti task force in response to the quality of life crime, which is what they consider graffiti to be. <clears throat> um, the task force consisted of law enforcement officials as well as politicians, who at that time also made it illegal to sell spray paint to anyone under the age of 18, as well as lock up spray paint to dissuade shoplifting. In 05, uh, Pittsburgh created a database in order to try and link tags of known graffiti artists to instances of graffiti art in order to aid with the uh, prosecution. And in 2006, Newcastle County of Delaware made the sale of spray paint and permanent markers to anyone under 21 illegal. Following the example of a similar law that was passed and then quickly um, repealed in New York City earlier that year. <clears throat> now the US isn't the only country who has passed laws in order to deter graffiti artists. European countries, Britain in particular, have recently uh, passed several pieces of graffiti related laws and acts such as um, the Keep, Briti blah, Keep Britain Tidy was passed in August of 2004 and, and supported proposals such as issuing on-the-spot fines to people caught tagging buildings, as well as banned spray paint sales to persons under the age of 16. It also went so far as to condemn the usage of graffiti images in adverts and music videos, saying that it is separated from reality and should not be shown as cool or edgy. Later that year, 123 MPs signed a charter stating that they'll do what they can to rid their country of graffiti and fight against graffiti artists, including Banksy, in particular was a main driving force for that year. And um, in 2008, a conspiracy charge was used to convict graffiti artists. Seven members of DPM were convicted with conspiracy to commit criminal damages that would cost at least one million pounds. Five received prison sentences and the rest were fined. <clears throat> in Australia, there aren't as many laws passed that ban graffiti as there were in Britain or in the US but they definitely have some very interesting legal stances on it. They have anti-graffiti squads under their employ who in, are in charge of cleaning pieces of illegal graffiti. Um, <clears throat> I specify the type of graffiti because Australia is one of the few places that have sections of the city that, um, that are walls that are dedicated to graffiti artists where they can legally tag and bomb if they want. Um, like everyone else, though, they have banned the sale and possession of spray paint for persons under 18. They have also made it so that if you're caught tagging, you can be fined up to 26,000 US or Australian dollars and get up to two years of jail time. If you're caught carrying spray paint without having a legal reason as to why, you can be fined up to 550 Australian dollars. <clears throat> There are several things that can be charged with when uh, doing graffiti, including vandalism. Uh, if you're doing the roadside signs or the digital billboards, you can be charged with hacking. Uh, trespassing, this is mostly ap applicable if you hop a fence or a cop breaking into the manager's office when doing the uh, digital menus. Upsetting public disorder, um, James Powderly from the Graffiti Research Lab, um, as well as several other activists and bloggers were charged with this and got 10 days jail time during a free Tibet demonstration in China. And murder. Um, 
This is only a one-time occurrence. I don't know if any of you remember in Russia, a gentleman hacked digital billboards to show pornography. Well, one of the people in their cars had a heart attack. And he, it was an older gentleman. He was really excited. Um, <laughs> so he died. And the hacker was then charged with the murder of that individual. So, with all of the aforementioned potential crime charges and government's drinking haterade, one may wonder who would be interested in partaking in virtual graffiti. Well, there are several people, including um, artists. It's a new medium that is in a public place and gets lots of exposure. Um, there we go. <clears throat> Protesters. Virtual graffiti could be very useful when protesting um, outrage acts. Um, protesting outrageous acts committed by local or federal governments. Uh, for example, I'm not surprised, actually I am kind of surprised that nobody has hacked the digital signs for the free Byron movement. Um, this would get a lot of attention. Um, extremists, digital billboards would be a great way for them to spread their message into a large aud audience quickly with little or no cost to them. Uh, governments, for the same reason as the extremists, and um, hackers, it's something new to exploit and learn about. And young people, because hormones plus destruction of someone else's properties equals lulls. And that's math. You can't argue math. Um, why are they interested? Well, um, there are many reasons, including um, vandalism. There will always be someone who gets off on destroying someone else's property. Guerrilla advertising. Spreading propaganda. I mean, why just settle for news, TV commercials, emails, and posters? By placing your message on the billboard network, it'll appear for eight seconds on every billboard in that particular network repeatedly for an undetermined amount of time. It's undetermined because it's until they notice that you hacked their sign. And finally, uh, you would want to do this for the lulls. Um, unfortunately, using this excuse will only be helpful if you are tried in internet court. Um, <laughs> Well, that's it. I'd like to take a second to thank a few people, namely Toten Dad for doing my slideshow, um, Rain and Nikita for making sure that I got off my ass and submitted a talk, and of course the Graffiti Research Lab, who does some really, really amazing stuff. Um, yeah, and that's it. Yeah, I'm done early. Uh, does anyone have any questions that you want answered now? Yes. <laughs> Troll. Um. <laughs> Uh, most of them are serial. Oh, the question, I'm sorry, the question was um, what kind of connections do they have in the control panel at the bottom of the digital billboards? And I found that in most cases it is serial. <clears throat> well, you, okay, so the follow up question was do you have to have a uh, certain type of terminal software or um, different uh, image types? Usually, uh, when you, if you want to have an image displayed on the digital billboards, it's a JPEG. There's a certain um, size, and it's all on the Clear Channel website, actually, because. <laughs> Well, exactly. Let's go break into some stuff. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> unfortunately, the digital billboards are only in certain places. Um, you guys don't have a lot of them out here in the West. You, Vegas is obviously an exception. But um, places like uh, Seattle, for example, doesn't have them yet. But a lot of people in uh, the Northeast and the South are starting to grow. Yes. Uh, 
Um, the question was, are there any examples besides the billboard in Russia of uh, digital billboards being hacked? And the answer is no. Um, <clears throat> there, I think it was 2008, 2009, they thought that Skull Phone hacked a clear channel uh, billboard in uh, California. Turns out he paid for it and then leaked uh, letters to different places saying he hacked it. But no, other than the one in Russia, there are no um, known cases of the billboards being hacked. Do I think it's possible? Yes. I just think we need to get off our butts and do it. <laughs> Well, they do have, okay, the question was how do you load the images basically onto um, the digital billboards and they do have that digital signage software. It's kind of hard to come across but they do offer a beta of the software on the company's website that you can download and use and if you feel like shelling out the cash for it, you can buy it and then BitTorrent for everybody else. Um, to my knowledge, no one has done it yet. Like I said, there hasn't been many cases of the billboards being hacked, so the knowledge on them are pretty limited. I didn't have the did the signage software on my machine when I went to go poke around, but um, so most of it's up to uh, research and speculation, unfortunately. The roadside signs have a control panel with everything preloaded that you just have to type in whatever you want displayed. Um, the, no, most of the um, electronic roadside construction signs uh, don't have a port or anything that you need to plug a machine into. Um, they have that control pad in which you can enter data. Um, Possibly some of the other manufacturers do have a place where you can insert a console, but I don't know about those. I didn't play around with those. I just played with the ADCO ones with the control panel. Yes, ma'am. I'm actually not a graffiti artist. I don't tag or anything, unfortunately. I'm not that cool. Um, I'm mostly interested in the electronic side of it. Anyone else? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I can't really hear you. Is that for the um, the menus or for the? Oh, yeah. Honestly, you don't really have to drive around to map them. They have um, on their sign where each and every billboard, or on their site, on the Clear Channel website, they have each and every location of every billboard they have up. If you wanted to for fun. <laughs> Um, that's actually a good question. I did not look into that, but I've, um, if you want to give me your email, I can uh, look into that and give you an, uh, an email back. <clears throat> but are quickly expanding beyond that and can be seen on digital billboards, road signs, and the side of buildings. I know that this sounds like a very large subject, and it is, so, uh, so much so that I have decided to break the speech up into four different parts. Uh, first, we'll cover the history of graffiti, uh, where we're going to discuss where it originated and how it got to the point where it is today. After that, we'll go over some examples, where I'll be covering things that have been done for a little while, and as well as some things that are shiny and new. And once I planted evil little ideas into your mind, <laughs> we're going to move on to legal concerns and government responses to graffiti. And finally, uh, who would be interested in this and why they should be interested in this.
So now that we all know what virtual graffiti is, we have to recognize the fact that we wouldn't be able to do virtual graffiti if we didn't have regular graffiti first. <clears throat> um, but does anyone have a guess as to how long graffiti has been around? Come on. Oh, does it? <laughs> so this just gave up the fact that I didn't do my slides. <laughs> um, <laughs> Unfortunately, Toten Dad is the one who does all my slides, and Nikita yells at me every year to do my own damn slides, and this is why. Um, so yeah, 30,000 years ago, and started with cave paintings and pictographs that were uh, made out of animal bones and uh, pigments. The reason that I say arguably is because there's some debate as to whether or not uh, the cave drawings were really graffiti. Um, prehistoric graffiti was occasionally used in religious celebrations and in those instances were endorsed by society, which is contradictive uh, to the current day definition of graffiti. Although it's debatable whether the cave drawings are examples of early graffiti, we can definitely say that it was popular in ancient Greece. <laughs> Um, in fact, the first known example of Grecian graffiti is viewable in the ancient city of Ephesus, which is in uh, present-day Turkey. Uh, the first graffiti drawing was evidently an advertisement for prostitution and was etched into stone near mosaics and walkways. The image itself was of a heart-shaped handprint, kind of like that, a footprint, and a number. The heart-shaped handprint was meant to represent uh, love in exchange for money. And the footprint and number are believed to represent how far one would have to walk in order to receive these services. Similarly, the ancient Romans are known for carving graffiti on walls and monuments. Some examples include curses, magic spells, political slogans, declarations of love, alphabets, and literary quotes, all of which were preserved in Pompeii after the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. There was also ancient Roman carvings that were made by young men to make themselves feel big, most of which can be found around at uh, gladiatorial academies, including one by Salatus, which states, uh, Suspirium polarum Salatus thrakes, or Salatus the Thracian makes the girls sigh. <laughs> Not to be outclassed by the Greeks, though, um, the Romans were also known for using graffiti to advertise prostitution. In one area, you can find an address for a well-known prostitute named uh, Novelia Primigena of Nuceria. And uh, in another, you can find etchings of phalluses with Mansueta Tene. It Next talk up, uh, intro to graffiti, virtual graffiti, and this is Tonikov. Let's give her a big hand. Hello everyone, like he said, I'm Totenkopf of the Neuronumerous Group, um, and today I will be talking to you about virtual graffiti. I originally wasn't going to submit this year or present a speech, but um, then Neon Rain and I got into a discussion about the growth of hacking electronic construction road signs, and then we uh, started talking about virtual graffiti in general, and how outside of the graffiti research lab, there's really not a lot going on or a lot of information about it. Next thing I knew, I was cursing her name and submitting my CFP. So before I get into all of the nitty gritty details about virtual graffiti, we're gonna discuss what it is. All right. The most commonly used definition for virtual graffiti is that it involves the use of virtual objects and or digital messages, images, animations, etc., that are applied to or viewable from public locations. They can be viewable through electronic devices such as computers or mobile devices, or in English, handle with care. Scrawled next to it. There are other many uh, lesser known instances of pre-modern graffiti, uh, including but not limited to carvings on the walls of uh, royal and or wealthy homes in the Ma of Mayans in the site of Tikal in Guatemala. The Vikings left markings and etched their names into ruins in Rome, New Grange, Mound in uh, Ireland, and one Viking, Halvdan, put his names on runes on a banister in um, Constantinople. Constantinople. I can't pronounce it. I'm from America. We don't care about anything outside of America, really. Um, various Renaissance artists would travel to um, the... No. No. Yeah. 
<laughs> Various Renaissance artists would travel to the ruins of Nero's Domus Aurora in order to carve or paint their names. French soldiers would carve their names on monuments during uh, the Napoleonic campaigns uh, in, um, in Egypt. And travelers along the Oregon Trail left their names at Signature Rock. <laughs> 